Hello everyone, it's Sylvia from Fairlight Tarot. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to have a look at what I think are the best alternatives to that indie deck you just cannot find, or may I just add, you just cannot afford. Let's have a look. First I wanted to say something about indie decks. Um, it feels like they've gone up in price in the last two, three years. And I don't know whether it's because that corresponds to obviously the inflation on the materials, for example, when you use better materials, unfortunately the price goes up. Um, it can also be due to um, worldwide inflation on fuel prices. So obviously when they ship from a country which is not your own, you have to include the shipping costs. And now if you are in Australia like I am, you're looking at $65 Australian to get something shipped to you from the United States. So obviously, even if a deck costs you $50, $60, you have to spend just as much money in, uh, in shipping. <laughs> and ultimately, that drives the prices up. And I don't know if I'm the only one thinking that, so please let me know in the comments below if you agree, but I do believe that I have seen a trend on raising prices for indie decks. Having said that, um, I love indie creators. I always support them when I can because I strongly believe in, you know, getting to get your products out there and um, expressing your own creativity through tarot. And there's so many indie creators that I absolutely follow and support and I admire them because they need a lot of courage to just, you know, get their art out in the world and be obviously going under the scrutiny of tarot collectors and tarot readers alike. And it's not that easy. So this video is on the one hand to just say to all of you, I am a tarot collector. I've been collecting tarot for over three decades. I have a I would say, from my point of view, it's a sizable collection. I have more than 500 decks. Um, many of those are indie decks. However, I know that um, in many, many cases, we cannot always afford an indie deck. And so what I'm going to try and do today is something that others have tried and accomplished before, but I haven't seen lately a video that does that. So I'm just going to show you the indie deck or a indie deck that might be really hard to find out of print and very sought after, or even just an indie deck that for several reasons, whether you cannot find it because the uh, creator doesn't ship to your country, or you cannot find it because it's uh, too expensive. And I'm going to show you a mass market alternative, so a mass market published deck, which I believe represents a good alternative to that indie deck you just cannot find or you just cannot afford. Okay, so first of all, I think it's useful to address the elephant in the room. And um, I'm talking about the Bones to the Earth Flesh Tarot by Avalon Cameron with illustration by my favorite Anatorian and the Tarot of Echoes, which is completely 100% by Anatorian. I have seen a lot of comments after my video in which I was showing this deck because it is one of my favorite decks. Anatorian is one of my, if not my, favorite illustrators of all time. I love her work, obviously, and uh, I try and get all of her decks. I was very lucky to follow her on Instagram and the moment in which she posted the link to pre-order the Tarot of Echoes, I immediately clicked on it, I ordered it and I think it was about three weeks ago or something like that, I received my copy in the mail. However, after my one of my latest videos, I don't remember which, which one, I know that there's a lot of people asking if there's going to be a reprint. Um, Anna has announced on her Instagram page that uh, she doesn't have the possibility to do a second, um, a second sale. And so, um, Basically, it, it really hurt a lot of people. I know that because there were a lot of people waiting for that second round, let's say in April. 
and uh, hearing that that's not going to be done, uh, what happened, it just provoked, it triggered some kind of a click frenzy because everyone tried to get a hold of the latest copies of the Tarot of Echoes that were still sold at a few resellers worldwide. I'm sorry to say, but Salon des Arcanes, which is a French reseller, has run out. And there is one at the time of filming this, which is, what time is it? Uh, it's the afternoon of Friday, the 22nd of March, Sydney time, Sydney Australia time. So as of five minutes ago, there was still one copy of the Tarot of Echoes in stock at the Valley Girls Tarot website for 175 US dollars. And that, that was the last one. After that, to be honest with you, I do not know if there's anyone else that is actually keeping it in stock. Um, if you don't have this deck, you may try your luck in one of the many Facebook groups where someone may um, want to part ways with their copies, or maybe they bought two copies, I don't know. Or you may want to wait for the mass market version of this deck. When it comes to the Bonestone and Earth Flash, I'm actually putting these two together because, um, sorry, don't worry, I am going to show you the cards. Because the Bonestone and Earth Flash has a similar story. So Avalon has actually announced uh, quite a some time ago, I would say. Uh, that there's going to be a reprint of the Bonestone um, with a mass market publisher. Um, I don't think there's uh, been any other announcement in regards to that, just a few confirmations. And I have to say this is really good news because on the one hand uh, this deck, the Bonestone and Earthflash, the Indie Edition, is now fetching really really high prices on, uh, well, on eBay, on resellers on Etsy or on Facebook groups and I honestly even though we're not supposed to comment on prices that people ask for I really do believe that sometimes inflating the prices is not doing any good to the creators either um, so um, I will just stop uh, short of saying what I think should be done because I unfortunately don't have um, I don't have a solution. Being a collector means that in some cases you have to be prepared to pay really high prices. And I also know and I believe that an object, let's say a collectible item, is as valuable as a collector is willing to pay. So prices are very difficult to monitor because I'm not entirely sure that it's correct to put a cap on, on prices of collectible items. Of course, if this is a deck, the Indie Edition, especially because the book on the Mark Mass Market Edition is going to be thinner, so obviously different. But if you're a collector, if you're ready to spend four, five hundred dollars on this deck on the Indie Edition, you might still be able to find it. However, if you've always wanted this deck and you do not want to spend that amount of money on an Indie deck, you can just wait for the Mass Market Edition because it has been confirmed that it's going to come out, even though no publisher, or at least at the time of filming, there was no announcement on publishers, and there was no announcement on the timeline. This is the Bonestone and Earth Flash. And I'm also going to show you, let's just leave it here, the Tarot of Echoes, although I have shown it before in my channel, as I was saying, probably a couple of videos ago. And this deck is unmistakably Anatorian's work. You, If you love her as much as I do, or, but even if you're just familiar with her work, you will see how familiar, <laughs> sorry, I said familiar twice, but you will see how it resonates with you, how you can recognize it easily. And it's one of those decks that it's all heart. For me, this is really a deck that hits the right spot. Um, this is the Tarot of Echoes. It, go, it has been produced by Anna with the intent of pairing it with the Oracle of Echoes, which are, by the way, still in D decks. There's no announcements on any of that going mass market, but they are still available for a reasonable price um, on Anna's website. 
This deck, if you were lucky enough to get a copy of the indie deck, you will know how much, how lovely this deck is. But if you could not uh, grab a copy, then don't despair because it is going to come out mass market probably next year. Now, the reason why I'm showing you these two decks is because not many people know that Anna has actually collaborated with Claire Duval for Le Tarot Arthurien. Now, um, this is a French deck. Let me just show you the product value of this deck being a French uh, mass market deck. And the edition is Edition Contredire. It's actually a fantastic deck. The reason why I'm saying that is because the book is really thick. It is very informative. And it's got a really excellent quality. As you can see, you have a full page of the card, and then you've got the title of the card. There is a sentence uh, associated to that. There's another title, there's a keyword, there's a sign, a zodiac sign associated to that. And then we go into the symbols of the card. So we might understand, I have an insight on the reasons why uh, the creators have chosen these particular symbols to, uh, to show you this card. There is a fairly good description on the meaning of the card and obviously we're talking about the upright meaning and the reverse meaning. There are a few prompts when it comes to journaling and then there's also a sacred quest. Now, you're going to say yes, but this is in French. Yes, true. However, recently, if you follow Anna's um, Instagram account, she's actually uh, launched a poll asking if there was interest from the tarot community or the tarot collectors for an English edition of Le Tarot Arthurien. And at the time of filming, again Friday afternoon, uh, 22nd of March Australia time, I can assure you that there was absolutely no, zero, no vote on no. So the yes votes were 100% of the voters, the no were zero percent and we're talking about hundreds of voters. I really hope that due to that and the very same fact that she was asking if there was interest in this means that she's actually planning or at least she's just testing the market to see whether there will be interest for an English version, must market the English version of this deck or not. If I were you and if I wanted this in English I would definitely go to Anna's account, find the poll and vote because obviously the more of us she will hear from uh, the more weight we will have on her decision whether to um, release an English version or not and I guess that obviously that depends a lot on Claire, uh, Claire Duval as well and obviously the uh, original publishers of this deck. I have to say between the three um, this is the one that, um, le let's say, it resonates um, most for me and it's probably because I am very familiar with the, uh, the legend, the Arthurian legend and I very much like it. It was the theme or the subject of one of my down the rabbit holes a few years ago actually a few, almost more, more than 10 years ago. So I was very stoked when I saw that Anna had collaborated with Claire in order to produce this deck, which is absolutely stunning, if I may say so. Now, I don't mean to say that these three decks are interchangeable. These three decks, even though the art style being, being eaten by the same illustrator um, is very similar, but on the one hand, we see the similarities and we can't help but thinking that there are different vibes to the three. So the Loto Arturian obviously is based on Arturian legend and it really, Anna did a fantastic job in portraying these kind of vibes and energy. And I have to say the book by Claire Duval is absolutely fantastic. But when it comes to the Tarot of Echoes, it really does have a different feel to it. Very, very specific, very beautiful. And I may say the same thing for the Bones and Earth Flesh. Now, I am very interested and curious to know if you had the possibility to choose amongst the three, uh, which one would you prefer? Because it's something that it, it's always interesting for me to know about somebody else's taste. 
Now, as I said, so Le Tarot Arthurien, which is this one, is actually a mass market French deck. And I believe that for now, if you want something before these two go mass market, you can actually feast your eyes on this fantastic artwork. Another deck that is an indie deck, really hard to find, out of print, even after there was a second and then a third printing from the creator, is the Yokai Yochi Taro. And this is an amazing, an amazingly beautiful deck. It's by Bubo Plague and it's a very respectful representation of the wonderful world that is Japan supernatural. So all the supernatural beings of Japanese folk folklore that has, uh, are actually called yokai and it's a really special deck because it's got a very specific kind of muted color palette let me just zoom in so we can see it a bit better the artwork is absolutely spectacular and uh, I have to say this is by far my favorite cardstock and we're talking about a very soft linen cardstock, linen finish, with a matte finish, and it's gilded in this kind of really high quality gold. This is a deck that has been used by me several times, and in spite of that it still looks pristine and untouched. On the one hand it's also because I love it so much I will always be extremely careful when I use it. But on the other hand, I, I do believe that it's because it's a really high quality deck and it's made to last. This is an incredibly beautiful deck. I know that um, if you like Japan Supernatural, the supernatural folklore of this wonderful country, you probably would have this deck. Or if you could not grab a copy, you probably are looking for something that can, let's say, satisfy your quest for the yokai world. Now, when it comes to these kind of decks, there has been what I feel like it's been a booming of supernatural or, you know, Japanese supernatural related decks. But my pick in this case will be the Taroki Yokai. Now, this is the Italian version. There's also a French version. But I have to say, um, it is nowadays very easy to use your phone and translate. And I think that it's really worth it because as an alternative to the Yokai Yochi, this deck is incredibly um, accurate in the depiction of these supernatural beings. So the description are excellent and they really reflect the images on the cards. And I have to say, and this is because I've actually uh, done a lot of work and we're still doing a lot of work with my members on the Yokai Yochi and on the Japan Supernatural Beings in general. I have to say that for many, many choices, I prefer the depiction and the yokais chosen by Mariana Zanetta and Matthew Maya in this deck, in the Taroki Yokai, to the ones chosen by Bubo Plague in the Yokai Yochi. This is an incredibly beautiful deck, but I do think that in some cases, the Taroki Yokai associates meanings with aesthetics, whereas in the Yokai Yochi you just see the association based on aesthetics. So for the Wheel of Fortune there will be a wheel, for example. Whereas in the Yokai Yochi there is a monumental effort which is made by the creators in order to establish an actual link between the Yokai represented in the cards and the essence of the Yokai and the cards itself. So it is a really beautiful deck, it's in color. It is a rather odd kind of shape if you, uh, this is a standard tarot uh, size and as you can see, it is basically just a sliver wider and quite a fair bit uh, taller, but it's okay. I mean, we don't necessarily um, need everything to be the same. And I have to say, after a while, I actually got around to this cardstock because at the beginning, the first time I, Pick this uh, deck up, I was really upset. Um, it is a very uh, thin cardstock. However, this also means that it's a lot easier for me to shuffle it because I do have uh, quite a few injuries in my fingers. And sometimes when a cardstock is stiff, yes, it is more durable, but you know, it is um, rather difficult to shuffle it. 
So this deck is absolutely incredible. It's very, very be beautiful. And it does, as I was saying before, it does a really good job in linking the meaning of the card in a traditional sense of the tarot in the RWS system to the yokai that is actually represented on the card itself. I may also say that this deck pairs up really, really well with an oracle deck which is this one here, and it's the Oracle de Camille et Yokai. This is a French deck by Caroline Dubin, and it's a really gorgeous deck. It's by, um, it's, it looks like it's the same edit publisher, but it's actually probably been licensed um, by a similar publisher. It's not, the name is not the same of the publisher, but look how beautiful. Let me just do the usual thing with the tarot and the oracle. So if we take the tarot decks into and we put it at the side of the oracle, you will see that it's an amazingly beautiful pairing. So the one thing that I find it's a bit, um, let's say, disappointing, but it's not a big deal, is the fact that the oracle deck does show you the name, Ane Onna, for example, of the yokai or the kami. Kami is more like a spirit, infused, let's say a being that is infused with spirit, but it's not necessarily um, a yokai. Um, so going back to this, I was saying that it's a bit of a pity that they didn't actually put the keyword um, associated to the yokai or the kami. It would have been a lot easier to make associations had that been the case. But having said that, I actually don't mind going back to the book and having to read about this because that deepens my knowledge on the world of yokais and that is something that I really absolutely adore. If you were into manga and anime when you were little, uh, this deck is absolutely superb and you will notice that, by the way, the tradition of manga is based on a good part on the tradition of supernatural beings or yokai in Japan. So it is not unusual to see some yokais being represented in manga and animes. So as I was saying, the yokai yochi that we've seen before is this deck here and it's an indie deck. It's unfortunately out of print and uh, hard to find. But if you're still interested in getting to know the supernatural, the wonderful supernatural world of Japanese uh, yokais, the Taraki yokai or Le Taro yokai and the Oracle de Camille yokai are very, very good alternatives. Another deck that is in the out of print and hard to find, and I don't have it, unfortunately, I cannot show you, I'm sorry about that, but it's the Persephone Tarot. And that deck, um, let's say that there's been a lot of decks that lately have tried to replicate that same kind of interest because they situate themselves in the same area of interest, which is Greek mythology. There's been a lot of fascinating attempts, but also there's been a lot of production when it comes to literary even Stephen Fry has written a couple of books related to Greek mythology and I feel that it's wonderful because of so much interest about this wonderful, wonderful um, world of myths and legends. Now, there, as I said, there's been a few attempts at reproducing um, decks that were similar, let's say, with curated art as well, similar to that indie deck. Um, unfortunately, for what I could see, even though they are absolutely gorgeous and fantastic, None of them is mass market. So I was really excited when I saw two decks coming out mass market that were in the same space, let's say dealing with the same themes. And one of them is the Circe. So Circe is the Italian way of pronouncing this. It's Circe, I guess, in English. She was a magician and she was a protagonist of uh, one of the many tales related to Ulysses' travels. And obviously, um, Circe 
there's been a couple of books also fiction books related to church that have been published in the market in the last couple of years and they really do signify the worldwide interest into these thematics uh, this is a Los Carabeo deck and has been created by Fabio Vizentin and Pierluigi Serra it's a very affordable mass market deck and I have to say they've done a fantastic job and I really, really enjoyed this deck. Now I was able to grab a copy when I was in Italy just recently so I didn't even have to pay for shipping of the Scarabelle decks to Australia. So I was, I was really, really stoked about this deck. I have to say Los Scarabelle is getting experimental in the sense that um, this is not the usual cardstock that you, you will be used to and I don't know whether they're trying to make a difference between what they call the deluxe um, decks with the, a uh, you know a two-part box for example and the tuck box perhaps that's the direction in which they're going so this deck is in order and uh, I have used it a couple of times but what I like to do with decks when I don't know them enough and by the way how beautiful is Neptune in the Emperor how beautiful is this card let me just zoom back in because I really want you guys to see it one of the things that I like doing with a deck that I want to study is every time that I use it I actually like to put it back in order because that way I don't have to force my mind in order to be able to make the connection with the card and the meaning. I see them in order and so I know exactly what follows next. And it's such a beautiful, really beautiful deck. By the way, my sincere apologies for the noises in the background. When I used to live in by the ocean, no one had a garden, no one had a backyard because they were extremely expensive. And now that I live in a more affordable area of Sydney, everyone has a garden, everyone has a backyard, and everyone is mowing them pretty much 24-7. So if you live in the suburbs, Low mowing is part of your daily life. So I will do my best to filter the sound out in the post-processing. But I have been waiting already for an hour for someone else to finish mowing and then obviously someone else has just started again. So if I have to wait for all of my neighbors to stop mowing, it's never going to be done. As you can see though, these cards are really, really beautiful. I admire the process, I admire the outcome. The color palette is fantastic and it does have that kind of a patina to it which makes it very relatable to the argument of the topics that it actually is illustrating. And one thing that I wanted to say because there's always the question of the guidebook whenever we talk about a Los Carabeo deck. What happens is that when it's a tuck box chances are that the guidebook is one in several languages and because of that they don't have enough room to be expensive on the writings for the cards. However, in this case, and I repeat, this is a deck that I bought in Italy. So this deck came with this little white book, which is all of it, and I mean all of it, from the first page to the last in English which means that you actually have the possibility to get into the nitty-gritty stuff related to the cards. So let's pick a card and uh, let's just shuffle it quickly because I really wanted to show you this is something that I want to praise Los Carabeo for doing because I really believe that I know that it's less accessible obviously if you don't speak English a deck that only has an English guidebook is less accessible to you. However, there are possibilities to get the translation. I think that they're also putting a QR code, uh, for example, to uh, scannerize that you can get the manual in a different language. So they've done a fantastic job and I really feel like praising Los Carabelle for doing that because I really want them to keep on doing that. Now let's just pick a card and let's see what the meaning is. And we got the Eight of Cups. So the Eight of Cups, we just go in here, we go under the Suit of Cups, which is the first one. And the Eight of Cups, Ulysses returns to Ithaca in the guise of an old beggar, thanks to the divine intervention of Athena, protector of the arts, 
battle strategies and wisdom. On his long journey, he is supported by a stick. So this is Ulysses basically trying to get home. I don't know if you're familiar with the legend, but it just, there was always something. And more often than not, it was just the Olympus gods deciding whether he should go home or perhaps really, really close to it. And then there should have been a squall or a, a storm and they would have lost their way back in the, um, in the sea again. So he's supported by a stick which helps him on his way. His path is lit and outlined by a shining moon. Freed from the trappings of everyday life, the traveler can move forward, now unburdened by the weight of human affairs. I love that way of describing the Eight of Cups, not just the association with the pilgrimages of Ulysses, but also the fact that you are unburdened. And that's something that really contradistinguishes the energy of the Eight of Cups for me. In the background appears his beloved Ithaca, so we can see Ithaca in the background. The city of the spirit and of distant loves, the longed for destination, keyword concreteness. Now, I don't know whether I always agree on the association with the keywords, but I do love the way in which they describe the cards. And I can assure you that that goes for minors and majors and core cards alike. So this is a fantastic alternative to the very, very expensive out of print and hard to find indie decks about the uh, Greek mythology. Another deck that I I wanted to show you with some small disclaimer is the Mythos Tarot. So this is the Mythos Tarot, let's just zoom out a bit and I do have to say something about this deck. This deck is a mass market deck, it's been published by Rockpool and it's been created by Helena Elias or Elias, sorry if I mispronounced that and it is indeed um, based on Greek mythologies. Now the one thing that I wanted to say about this deck is that there is a lot of, um, uh, let's say, beautiful people, but picture perfect. Not a lot of diversity, let's put it this way, in this deck when it comes to body shapes. But let me just show you because it might just be easier. Now you have to, let's say we have to accept that there is this position by the creator on illustrating these deities for what they actually are. So Greek gods obviously were gods, they were depicted in very much human kind of guises I may say, um, but when it comes to this kind of beauty, and I mean beauty with between brackets, I don't mean beautiful as in what we think is beautiful, but beautiful as in you would probably see it in a Vogue magazine from the 90s or the noughties for example. So you know, there's not much, as I said, not much diversity when it comes to body shapes. There is some diversity when it comes to color, as, uh, skin color. There is some diversity when it comes to age differences, but not that much either. Um, I do, however, believe that this is a very conscious choice that has been made by the author. And whether we agree with that choice or not, that is something that probably is varying person to person. So I don't feel like commenting on that. What I do believe is that this is done because they indeed represent the archetype of that kind of deity. So I don't know if it makes sense, there is another deck that I know and I absolutely adore and it's the True Black and also the Ephemere Tarot by Arthur Wang. And there's also been the same discussion on in the tarot community about the fact that there's not a lot of diversity when it comes to those two decks. I still believe that that really depends on the fact that we should look at those images portraying some kind of supernatural beings. So I agree that there is no diversity, but on the other hand, I do look at them in a different way. I do not see human beings. And in the same way, I actually do not see human beings in these cards. I do, however, see uh, they're corresponding on the Greek mythology. Now, when it comes to the book, I have to say it's, it's really well done. 
So the first card I'm looking at here is the Judgment card with Athena, Goddess of Wisdom, Battle Strategy and Reason. And there is a little bit of description, one of the most famous and beloved goddesses of the Grecian people and one of the 12 Olympians. Athena was a fierce arm warrior goddess, so her aid was often synonymous with military prowess. So what we've seen here is risen and fallen. And that's a very interesting take on that because um, if you follow Greek mythology, you will remember that but pretty much in any kind of mythology, there is that sense of fallen God. Even if, for example, we have a look at Lucifer. So Luf Lucifer used to be an angel, but it fell and it fell from heaven. And so therefore there is this sense of falling and or rising on the other hand. And so these two need to be read as upright and reverse meaning of the card. And I have to say, this is a really interesting take on the deck. When it comes to the minors, as you can see, we also have, we have a smaller kind of the description but we still have the reference to the specific god we're looking at and we also have references to the upright and reverse meaning of the card so this one with that disclaimer that i introduced with this deck that obviously we're looking at picture perfect bodies and not much diversity but can still be a really valid alternative to those really expensive out of print and hard to find indie decks and the next deck I want to talk about is actually an Oracle deck. And this Oracle deck, the reason why I'm showing you this, it's the Oracle Magique et Medium. And this is the French mass market version of a pretty expensive indie deck, which is called exactly the same. So the um, Magic and Mediums Oracle. Uh, so it's really interesting that the publisher, the mass market publisher Arcana Sacra, has actually uh, reached out to the creators in order to produce a French mass market version of this deck. I have to say I am absolutely stoked about this deck because um, it is very faithful in the reproduction of the uh, of the deck itself. The one thing that they actually part ways from the indie edition is the one thing that the indie edition had that I actually did not like, and it was the huge border. So if you're familiar with the indie edition of this deck, it does indeed have really large borders. I am generally speaking not a borders person, however there are some decks that really, um, you know, the borders of which really enhance the, um, the images on the cards, this is not one of them. So I really, really like this borderless version of this deck. Now, I don't know whether you're familiar with the English version, it is an indie version and it is rather expensive and in Australia, for example, we used to have a reseller that was keeping this deck in stock. Unfortunately, they ran out and they announced that they were not going to restock it um, for the foreseeable future. So I don't know whether the indie deck is actually out of print or not, the English version I mean, but this is a really valid alternative and let me tell you, it's a really gorgeous deck. It's a very easy to understand um, deck in the sense that even though it is in French there's very let's say easy and understandable uh, keywords. Glamour is glamour. Um, you know when you look at movement, movement is movement, conjuration, uh, apprenticeage, you remember the word apprentice so obviously you can make your own inference but it is concentration, it's concentric guard, guardian is guardian. So as you can see, it is not a, a difficult deck to use. And I would say this is very, very enjoyable and it's very accessible. And when it comes to the price, it doesn't break the bank. So I would definitely recommend if you were looking for the Oracle Magic and Mediums and you cannot find it anymore, or if it is outside of your comfort zone when it comes to the costs. This one is a very valid alternative and this one can actually be found on Amazon France. Although of course in that case you would have to pay for shipping which is a bit of a pain. 
The next deck I want to talk about is the Spacious Tarot. Now this deck is absolutely gorgeous. It is an indie deck by Carrie Mallon. I follow Carrie. Uh, she has a really beautiful YouTube channel as well and I really think that this deck has no, no other deck that goes even near how beautiful this is. However, what has happened, if you're in Australia you will know, this one has become almost impossible. I would say at this day, today, 22nd of March, it is impossible to find anyone in Australia who carries this deck on stock. It is not cheap and uh, the uh, cost of getting it sent out of the US now go at around 60 to 6 to 70 dollars Australian, even for a small deck like this, because obviously you will have to pay GST on top and, uh, you know, because of uh, shipping cost, generally speaking, going up in price. So if you always wanted to have this deck, use this deck, but you never could because of several reasons related to cost or for availability. And let me just show you quickly because this is a really beautiful deck. I absolutely love the color palette. I love the fact that it's a landscape and animal only kind of deck because I do believe that we need those kind of decks in our collections every now and then. We have that sense of a space that comes from looking at these cards that sometimes is exactly what we need, especially when we're dealing with something. And in my case, I have two or three decks that I use. Uh, for this kind of work that I want to do on myself or also for clients and I have to say the Spacious Tarot is definitely one of the favorites when it comes to my taste but also my client's taste. But in any case, if you didn't have the possibility to get this deck, uh, first of all I, I also urge you to uh, check out the uh, Facebook groups because it can actually happen that sometimes it goes on sale someone who wants to part ways with it and you might actually get it without paying at the original price but without paying the prohibited um, shipping costs. But if you instead want to try something else that has a very similar vibe and if you've watched my channel I'm sure you'll know which deck I'm going to talk about next. Yes, it is the Tarot Landscapes by Francesca Matteoni and Yoshimari, the illustrator. It has been published by Vivida and it's a mass market deck. It is an absolutely gorgeous deck. It comes with this kind of uh, drawer uh, shape box. Um, inside you find another tux, uh, attack box and also the book or the guidebook. Let me just um, set this aside. So this is an incredible deck and the reason why I'm saying this is because I've had it for a few months already. I cannot stop talking about this deck in my channel and uh, the reason is that this deck actually shows you some really wonderful landscapes from around the world and for each and every one of these cards there's actually a really wonderful description and at the end of of the guidebook because not everyone actually knows this there is there is this note on the pictures by Francesca and she literally says that uh, she would like to thank the places and people who inspired some of these landscapes for the Seven of Cups the newsletter Medusa edited by Matteo De Giulli and Nicolo Porcelluzzi published a photo on December 9 2022 of an octopus riding a jellyfish on their Instagram page Inspiration for the Three and Seven of Pentacles came from two different corners of Bromsey Island and the south of England where for years I have been working on a project to reintegrate the European Red Squirrel. For the Five of Pentacles, the terrible images of wildfires from the summer of 2019 in Australia. Lest we forget. For the Five of Wands, the chestnut woods of Sambuca Pistolese that I have visited so often. For the Ten of Cups, two special creatures, a cat and a dog named Serafino and Frix. Made their run free over the rainbow. By the way, for that last sentence, I had to stop and start at least three times. So that I can't finish that sentence without just with my eyes welling up because I, I am I am a fur mom and I've had fur babies and I lost fur babies and I just know how heartbreaking that is. For the hermit, my mind wanders to the Torre del Fattucchio overlooking the Sestaione Valley in Pian degli Ontani in the municipality of Abetone Cotigliano. Uh, Pistoia. So there's also a note by Yoshimari, which is the illustrator of the deck, 
Um, so uh, they say, in, in my illustrations are an escape from the prison of detail and realism. They are designed to accompany the observer or the, or the reader on a journey, leaving space for them to immerse themselves fully in the created atmospheres and their contemplation. And I have to say, they absolutely nailed it. They absolutely nailed it. This stack is absolutely wonderful. It is very moving, especially when you take your time, you observe the cards, uh, you cannot not feel the heart in these cards. There is so much life in these cards. I absolutely love using it. Um, it's really beautiful. Um, the meaning of the cards are absolutely wonderfully illustrated and they are very easy to relate to and it does resonate with a lot of us. It's one of the decks that come out once every 10 years. And I have to say, I am so very happy that we, this was actually a gift from a dear friend of mine in the tarot community. She saw this deck and she thought of me and she told me this deck make me cry and uh, you're going to love it. And I thought of you when I saw it and she sent it to me as a gift. And I have to say she was spot on 1000% because I really cannot stop talking about this deck. And I know that it has been recently published in the US as well. So it is available if you want to grab a copy. It's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, it is a really valid alternative to the Spacious Tarot. And now I just wanted to mention a couple of decks that have yet to be released. They are... All three of them from Rockpool, I had the opportunity to purchase them during the latest Mind Body Spirit Festival here in Sydney a couple of weeks ago. And I am pleased to say I am I was really looking forward uh, to this deck in particular by Anna Siegel. It's called Heal Yourself Oracle, Intuitive Guidance to Transform Your Soul. And it's an absolutely beautiful deck. But the reason why I wanted to show it to you, apart from the fact that indeed it is not it has not been published yet it will be published at the same time and released sorry it's been published but not yet released so it will be released at the same time uh, in uh, US and also in Australia and uh, it's a really beautiful deck so if you know Inna Seagull you probably remember the many actually oracle decks she's a very prolific author and creator and the reason why I was so excited about this deck is because this art style and also the thematic, also the characters depicted on the cards, really reminds me of a tarot deck that I absolutely love. And I'm just going to show you the pairings because I'm talking about the Tarot of Vampires by Ian Daniels. And this deck has a very similar art style and I always, I've always been looking for an oracle deck that could pair well with this tarot deck because it is really gorgeous. And I'm happy to say that these two together are absolutely fantastic. And so I'm so very happy that I found this one. And the reason why I just wanted to mention it um, today, it's not because this deck may be, look at this. Sorry, interrupt myself, but look how beautiful. The, it looks like they're almost made by the same hand. They're not, obviously it's different illustrators, but there is a very common sense of vibes here. There's also, you can notice, um, for example, the directionality, help from above, and the character here is actually looking towards the five of grails, perhaps indicating that this situation of loss it could be resolved if you know we look beyond the immediate loss of the spilled uh, two or three cups. Um, after the uh, situation in which we found ourselves having to do something not necessarily moral for us with the seven or knives. So I love when two decks don't only share a very similar color palette or a very similar art style and therefore go hand in hand when it comes to aesthetics, but I also really love it when they make me dream because when I pair them up together, this is what is basically happening. So we're looking at the cards and they make us dream. They make us dream about meanings. They make us dream about connections. And you know, if they resonate, it's an even more reason why to get in touch 
with, uh, with these decks, with what they mean, with the cards, with the atmosphere they evoke, and with the vibes that they contain. So, uh, wow, hole in the soul. Ordinarily, I have to be honest with you, this would not even be my, my style because I find it a bit too um, sensual um, in order to, and sometimes it can be a bit distracting. But I actually had to get over that opinion because when I started working with the Tarot with Vamp of Vampires, I actually found how it reads and it's an absolute gorgeous and, and very insightful kind of deck and so I am so very happy that I found an oracle deck that is really really it pairs up really really well with this one so that was honorable mention number one and it's the oracle um, Heal Yourself by Anna Siegel and the next honorable mention is also a deck um, published and released by Los Carabello this is actually a Shall I call it re-release? I mean, it's basically the uh, combination of two existing Oracle decks, the Oracle of Heaven and the Oracle of Hell by Travis McHenry, which has become, thanks to his magician martyrs and madman, has become one of my favorite tarot creators uh, of late. Um, I love that deck so much. So I was very curious when I saw this one because I used to have the Oracle of Heaven. I think it was called the Angels Tarot and the Oracle of Hell was called the Occult Tarot. Um, however, I didn't really find the right spot for those two decks in my collection and, and nor in my practice. And so I'm very curious to see whether this is going to change my mind about these decks. It is uh, a deck that uh, I believe is now available. At uh, the time I bought it from the Mind Body Spirit Festival was not available. It is an incredibly chunky deck as you can see because it does represent the combination of those two decks and I think that there's also a couple of new uh, cards that have been added for the exclusive purpose of creating something very complete and as you can see we're talking about 70 two cards however overall we're talking about 144 um, characters let's say because each and every card has got two characters one corresponding to the angelic energy and one corresponding to the infernal energies so this deck can be used obviously as an oracle deck we do have keywords uh, for the upright and the reversed meaning However, what I find is that in many cases it is a sort of a, almost a divinatory system by itself and even though it can be pair up, for example I'm thinking about the um, the Ephemia Tarot and the True Black Tarot that was mentioned before because there is this sense of duality between heaven and hell uh, also that can be seen uh, for example in those two decks. But I think that this is probably best to be used on its own. However, it is such a beautiful deck when it comes to the aesthetics that, you know, you can always use it with a tarot deck. And in specific, I was thinking about probably muted colors uh, for a tarot deck with muted colors, perhaps uh, the uh, Tarot of the Abyss by Anna Turian, which is a black and white deck, or perhaps, um, other black and white decks that off the top of my mind, perhaps the Hyde Tarot or even the Inkwitch Tarot, mm, even though it's not black and white but it, it does have a muted color palette. Um, what I like is the possibility to really build on it in the sense that you can definitely, um, you know, you can even shuffle it with reversals. Uh, which is something that I generally never do. I do re-reversals, but I don't shuffle reversals. So I understand depending on the position of the card, on the spread or the cards around it, if I need to read the card as reversed or upright. Uh, but working with this one would be very interesting. And it is an horrible mention because I haven't, I, I think I've only shown an unboxing of this deck as soon as I got it but I have actually never shown how to work with this deck and I just wanted to show you how well it pairs up for example with the Citadel Oracle. Now I know that I'm pairing up two Oracle decks which is generally something that I don't do 
But I really believe that these two can work really well together because the Citadel Oracle tends to me to tends to be, or at least it looks to me more like an archetype type of deck. So let's have a look. Here you go. So now I've actually made sure to shuffle the Oracle of Heaven and Hell with reversals. And so we'll be able to see the way in which the cards read upright or reversed. And uh, now um, it's kind of difficult to distinguish whether it's upright or reversed based just on the names, unless your knowledge of demons and angels is very thorough. Uh, in many cases, of course, it's easier to recognize them, but in some cases, or at least my knowledge is not that good they actually assign to different colors. So we've got red or burgundy red assigned to hell and black assigned to heaven. And uh, now we do have the same kind of red or you know black and white as we can find in the Citadel Oracle. So as you can see, it actually reads quite well. So we got the archetype in the Citadel Oracle and we can um, look for insight on that particular archetype if we focus on the keywords that are proposed by the Oracle. So the captain, in this case, we're taking command and teamwork, which is associated with this card, which is depicting Zagan, and natural passion. So this is a, an advice, is um, the captain has to take command and make sure and ensure that teamwork is carried out in a proper way and, and you know necessarily sometimes even ignoring their own inclination and passions because a captain has to be absolutely impartial so we can we, we can see how these two interact together the miser with stubbornness and inflexibility with the mabaya with fountain of wisdom so if we let go of that stubbornness of the minor, that kind of impossibility to see beyond our very own troubles, we can actually be free, uh, free up some energy to uh, reach an, a deeper level of wisdom and understanding. The herald with small regrets and longing and Mihail uh, with the restoration of life and the merchant with undress and folly. For example, the folly that takes a hold of merchants sometimes because when we let that sense of pride and also the self-worth um, you know, get a hold of us, uh, then we do reach that sense of folly. Uh, the pilgrim opportunities and growth with Manakel, uh, knowledge of good and evil. So obviously, it, uh, the more we experience the world, we can form our own knowledge of what's good and what's evil. So I really like using these two in many different ways. So when you do these kind of pairings, obviously, it needs to have, well, first of all, you can do it for aesthetic reason or for meditation or just because you absolutely love the cards which is absolutely fine but I think that when we try and collocate that or integrate this kind of use of the cards in our own practice what we can do is studying archetypes and so this will definitely be very helpful when we're trying to associate uh, you know an archetype to some kind of personal growth for example we can have a look and identify a sort of an archetype that uh, is for a client or for ourselves that depends so i see here the divine and divine timing and evaluation so obviously in this card i can probably recognize myself because in many cases, I have to um, be that person that looks at what things may come. And if we pair up with spiritual communication, that is exactly one of the ways in which this archetype finds its own meaning. So we can use that to go deeper into the study or the identification with the archetypes that we see in the Citadel Oracle. And apart from that, I really do believe that, you know, aesthetically they are quite pleasing together. So these two, again, well, the Citadel Oracle is obviously not a new, but this is the Oracle of Heaven and Hell by Travis McHenry. And last but not least today, I wanted to show you this deck, which is the Resurrection Oracle by Jenna de la Grottaglia. This is also a uh, rock pool deck, and I think that if it's not being released yet, it soon will be, perhaps next week. 
um, at the same time again in the US and Australia and uh, probably later on in the UK and Europe. This is an incredibly beautiful deck. I have to say um, this is not the first deck. Jenna de Grotaglia is also a very prolific creator and um, some of uh, Jenna's decks have been published by Rockpool as well, if not all of them. The fact that I just wanted to stop for a second and mention this deck is because I really believe that the work Jenna has done on this deck is absolutely fantastic. And it really helps as well that it's been published in one of those what they call the Lux Oracle, the Lux products by um, Rockpool. Now the guidebook is also kind of interesting but I think that the strength of this deck actually lies in the keywords that accompany the cards and the cards themselves. So the concept behind this deck which is called Resurrection, Resurrection and admittedly is a bit of a strange title to give to a deck but this deck actually looks at all the stages of life in a very compassionate way. So much so um, that this deck is one of those decks that again will really surprise you by not just how accurate it can be, let me just zoom it back in, but also how deep. So we got the various stages of life, but what we can do is relate to them. The coupling, for example, your first time. There is a sense of innocent, innocence in these characters. There is also a sense of longing. Longing for a life that in itself is complete. We have all of the stages of life. And yet, if we look around us, many of us, are not able to go through some of these stages. Some of us, for example, jump to an adulthood because of a traumatic childhood. In other cases, we won't be able to reach a turning point in our life, for example, because of, probably because of several obstacles that we encounter along the way. Or we won't be able to find our own niche when it comes to you know, finding your own voice and being able also to express it. And some of us find ourselves in a situation, in a position in which we feel sick and tired. And this, these cards, not just this one, but all of these cards are absolutely very eloquent when they really put together the concept of the keywords that are on the sides and the artwork, artwork itself. Now, I have to say, this is a very evolved type of AI. You will remember that there have been a couple of Oracle decks also published by uh, Rockpool in the past couple of years where the use of AI was, let's say, it felt unnatural for the human brain to actually try and relate to. I have to say, in this case, the AI tools have been used um, to correct the images, to correct the artwork that has been generated by the artist. But this is a really, really beautiful deck and I highly recommend it for, as I said, the deeper understanding that it will give us on the various stages of life. It is also a very truly emotive, emotional kind of deck. And this was the last one that I wanted to show you today. So I really hope you've enjoyed seeing all these decks, which represent, I believe, alternatives to really expensive or really hard to find independently produced decks. I myself am a collector, so I highly encourage you to pursue your taste. If you prefer an indie deck, of course, go for it. But I just wanted to give you an alternative, a more affordable kind of alternative. So thanks, as always, for being with me till the end of this video. More to come. Have a great day.